Well, good morning and welcome to Community Evangelical Free Church this morning. If you'll stand with us, we're going to be called into worship this morning from Psalm 9, 1 through 2. It says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. So let's join together and sing praise to the Most High this morning. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? seated. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nate Phelps. I'm a member here uh, at Community, and I was asked this morning to do our pastoral prayer. Um, and so I just want to remind us as, as a body that the pastoral prayer is used to point us to Christ, to show us his glory, and to connect the body of believers. 
In doing this, we recognize that we are not a bunch of individuals, but rather we are one family before God, fully dependent upon him. And the thing I want to pray for this morning is unity amongst God's people. I believe it is quite evident that we are living in a time with much division being based upon differing opinions. What are we supposed to do about COVID? Is Black Lives Matter justified in their response, or should we join them? Or with the upcoming election, many people will be identifying as either Republican or Democrat and feeling like the other person has to do the same thing. And I think Satan would want nothing more than to divide God's church during this season. And so it's important that we go before God and we ask for help to unify as one before him. Ezekiel 36, 22 to 28 says, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle, you, sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from, um, from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. So let us pray this morning. Father, you are a great God. You are greatly to be praised. You do not act for our sake, but rather you act for the sake of your holy name. Please forgive your church as we have so often uh, not identified ourselves as the people of God, but rather as Republican or Democratic. Please forgive us because many of our non-Christian neighbors have not seen us as any different from them. Please forgive us as we have forgotten that we are a holy people set apart for your glory. Through your work in our church and in our lives, may those around us know that you are the Lord, that you are the King of Kings. We ask that you would come this morning and cleanse us from the idols we have so easily, we so easily create in, li in our lives and worship with our hearts. Thank you, God, that you are the one who has given us a new heart and a new spirit. Help us to walk in your statutes and to obey your rules. May we know that you are, um, we are your people and that you are our God. I ask that you would cause this year to be a year of unity and not division. As we know, Satan would love to tear this church apart, and we ask that you, Holy Spirit, would work greatly in our lives to not allow this to happen. May you convict us of our sins of selfishness and caring more about being right than listening to our brothers and sisters. Would you bring redemption to broken relationships, and would you cause the conversations not to be about who we are voting for, but how we are loving and lo loving you and loving your people. Jesus, thank you that you came to earth, that you lived the life that we could never live, and that you died the death that we should have died, and that you rose from the dead for your people, overcoming sin in a way we never could. May you be glorified in our unity during this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, my name is Colton, and I have the pleasure of reading our scripture passage today. It's going to be Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. Acts 11, starting in 19. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who were coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When they came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. 
And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending to, to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. This is God's word. Thanks, Colton, for reading that. Well, just a few announcements as we begin. Um, it's still me. <laughs> I've had a beard for the better part of six years, uh, but it, it's still still me up here. Um, I just look five years younger. Uh, pe- people ask me if I'm old enough to be a pastor. Um, speaking of old enough to be a pastor, is Noah still in here? Did Noah go in? Walk- there he is. Um, so I'm just going to announce, it's a part-time staff person at our church, Noah Gwynn, lead worship up here, got engaged the other week, so we're thankful for that. We wouldn't normally announce every engagement, but he's on staff and uh, been involved in this church about 23 years <laughs> of his 25-year life. So um, the other announcements I want to make just briefly is that we're going to suspend third service uh, till we need to bring it back. So that's what's happening. Um, It's been ridiculously hot at 9.45 most Sundays and even hotter at 11. So we're going to do that for a while. And then a few other things. You may have seen the scrolling slides for it, but there's a seminar we're going to do, a conversation and and teaching time on race and grace. So um, just talking about all the things related to this cultural moment that we find ourselves in and how our church can learn and listen and be helpful even as we speak. And so some of our most thoughtful Christians that have been thinking about those issues for a long time are going to present. There'll be a panel discussion, time for questions, statements, all of that. So that's on the website in your bulletin. The other thing is that our outreach team is going to host a seminar on a Saturday coming up here soon. And uh, you'd be invited to that. Uh, anybody who wants to learn more about outreach and doing different things, uh, Volker's here in the service. Uh, you could talk to him about it. Or um, on the outreach page on the website, you'd hear more. So that's all things that are happening. Let's turn our attention to God's Word. Our sermon series in the book of Acts has been called Without Hindrance. And so so the title, Without Hindrance, the church going forward without hindrance, comes from the last word in the last verse in the last chapter of the book of Acts. Now, I know without hindrance is two words, almost even three, without being a compound word in English. It's one word in Greek, without hindrance. It's the final note in the book, the last word in the last verse in the last chapter in the book, and it's a statement that all of the obstacles stacked against the expansion of God's love to more and more people are no match for God and His church. But that's not to say the obstacles are not significant. They are. Many hindrances would seek to undermine growth. It's like our lives too. You probably could list very quickly just four or five hard things in your life right now. You just think about what they are. Name them. Two, three, maybe four, maybe even five hard things that at times it can feel like these things are stacked against your relationship with God and knowing Him in deeper ways and serving Him well. A few months ago as we were preaching through the book of Acts, I likened the book of Acts and the church growing and the way Jesus builds his church in surprising and unlikely ways to a, a tree growing in a gutter. Like there's, there's, it's, it's almost like there's just this inhospitable soil. It shouldn't be growing, but there it is growing. The Lord bringing growth and joy. I think this passage is just one more in a series of many passages throughout the book that speak encouragement to God's people that he can build and does build his church. When we pick up in Acts chapter 11, right, right in the middle through the end, um, it's Luke's way, chapter 11, verse 19, of doubling back to something he had mentioned many chapters before. When a faithful man named Stephen died for preaching. So 
when we looked at the story of Stephen's death back in chapter 6 and 7, I said that Stephen's life was brief but bright. And Stephen's life in the book of Acts is like this flare gun that gets shot across the sky in the book of Acts. And when his light goes out, a wildfire of missions roars across the pages of Acts. Well, that was the theme that got surfaced several chapters ago. So, for example, chapter 8, verse 4, we read this. And those who were scattered because of the persecution around Stephen's death, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Chapter 8, verse 4. The persecution led to scattering, and the scattering led to preaching. And what followed chapter 8, verse 4, was stories about Philip, then stories about a guy named Paul, then stories about Peter, and now in chapter 11, verse 19, it's like Luke is lumping all of that together. The stories of preaching and scattering and persecution and lumping it back together. So look, look with me again how our passage opened. Chapter 11, verse 19. It says this. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution, almost identical to chapter 8, verse 4, that arose over Stephen, now it's different, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word. The persecution in the wake of Stephen's execution created scores of religious refugees, men and women and children, who had the love of God burning in their hearts, but they no longer had a home in this world, a place they could call their home. They'd been uprooted. How are they going to grow? Following Jesus, it didn't, didn't make their lives better. So we read so often in the Bible, it seems in many ways it made it worse. But, but as they traveled, they loved Jesus so much. Jesus was so precious to them. What they gained by following Jesus was better than what they lost by not following him. So that as they scattered, they also preached about Jesus, his love, his forgiveness, his grace and mercy. And their persecution produced preaching. So what we find front and center, right after that verse, is this man named Barnabas. It's not the first time we meet Barnabas in the book of Acts. It's not going to be the last time. He is a humble, godly, loyal Christian. You want friends like Barnabas. In fact, I would say if you have one friend, maybe even two friends like Barnabas, you are rich in this world. Look at the way Luke describes him. I'm going to read verses 23 and 24 again. When he, this Barnabas, came and saw the grace of God, we're going to come back to that later, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, all these new Christians. For he, Barnabas, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Barnabas is a good man, Luke says. And you don't just have to take his word for it. Luke puts Barnabas' character and Barnabas' actions on display. When the church in Jerusalem heard this report that there were some new Christians who needed help, Barnabas says, here am I. Just, just send me. I'll go encourage him. And Barnabas goes. Because, and where Barnabas goes, encouragement goes. In fact, that's actually in chapter 4, what his name Barnabas actually means son of encouragement. He had his another name. He was such an encourager, their name, hey, we're just going to call you son of encouragement. That's what they do with Barnabas. And when he goes, he encourages them to keep at it, to remain faithful to the Lord, verse 23. Also what it says in verse 23, if you have a Bible, just, just look down at it. It's in the Bibles at the end of the row. This won't be on the screen again. But in verse 23, it says, when he came and saw the grace of God, he was what? What does it say? He was glad. Think about that. This was a church of a bunch of Gentile Christians, which I'll say more about later. And they've been Christians like five minutes. They came from pagan, secular backgrounds. When they gathered, you, you'd better believe... This was a messed up, kind of stumbling through life sort of church. They loved Jesus, but they had some rough edges. And Antioch itself is a church of 500,000 people at this time. 500,000 people. It's the third largest city in the Roman Empire, only behind only Rome and Alexandria. 
Barnabas is right in the heart of what we would, might call a Las Vegas or an Amsterdam, helping people, this small, small kind of marginalized band of believers follow Jesus well. And he's happy about it. He's happy because just by chance, this group of Christians, which is not a group of cha- chance at all, um, is being built up. The Lord has caused them to grow in an inhospitable soil. And Barnabas sees the Lord's hand in all of this, sees the Lord's grace, and he's happy. We'll just pause a minute and ask, can we do that? How good at that are we? When you come to church, what do you, what do you see? In fact, what do you come to church to see? The grace of God? I mean, just, just for a question, I'll ask, can you marvel at how unlikely it is that all of us, largely all Gentiles, are gathered here in Harrisburg, somewhere so far flung and remote from Jerusalem as we are, to worship Jesus some 2,000 years after his earthly life? Is that amazing to you? Can we forget that sometimes we have to meet outside in the rain or the heat and forget about masks and all the rest just for a moment and just marvel that we're here at all? I don't think we're a very impressive church. We don't have an impressive church leadership. I'm a part of that. But I think if Barnabas could see us, oh, he'd be glad at the work of God continuing here among us. His eyes were trained to see it. That's what he went to places looking for. Luke keeps going on and on about him. When Barnabas has all these new converts around him clamoring for his attention, he could have soaked it up, could have reveled in the fact of being the guy, right? The guy people need. The guy who has all the answers, the guy who leads leaders, but instead he thinks, I know what I'll do. I'll go find Paul. (laughs) Paul would love to come help these new converts because he's a new convert himself. It's been a couple years. Let's get Paul here. He's steeped in the Old Testament. These people need to know about the Old Testament, the story of the people of God. Let's get Paul over here to help. So he does. Together, Paul and Barnabas, they do evangelism and discipleship for a whole year. They share about the goodness of Jesus, what it's like to know him and to love him, to serve him. And these disciples, these new believers, these new converts begin to look more and more like Christ in their life. And so much so, they begin to speak so much about Jesus, so much about Christ that they begin to be called Christians. Apparently, for the first time we read in verse 26. And Barnabas does so well at training these Christians that when they learn there's a famine coming, they just leap at the chance to help. Think about that too. It's, it's not when times are easy that Christ shines brightest. But when life is hard, when you're planted in inhospitable soil, I mean, right now, I really believe it's a time for our church to shine. Look what Barnabas' disciples do when life is hard. Verse 29 and verse 30. So the disciples, when they learned of this famine, determined everyone according to his ability to send relief, this money, to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Simple verse, in a way, verses. Think about money with me for a minute. Money for good or ill is a big deal in the book of Acts, as it is in the Bible. Acts chapter 1, we read of Judas who betrayed Jesus, which was done for money. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira are enslaved to greed and it destroys them. Acts chapter 8, there's, we just preached about this a few weeks ago, beginning of June. A man named Simon, they call him Simon the Magician, and he wants to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. Thinks, he thinks Christianity and the, the blessings that come with it, you just it's something you can buy. Acts chapter 16, Paul and another Christian we're going to meet later called Silas, they're jailed. Why? Because their preaching disrupts the economic system of the city they're in. 
And people won't, don't want anything to do with it, and they throw them in jail. Same thing happens later in Ephesus when a certain silversmith loses all of his in- income because nobody wants to buy his statues anymore. Money is a powerful idol. Our question, when money, money comes up in the Bible, it's an invitation not to think, okay, is money or a temptation or not for me, but rather to be asking the question like, in what ways is money tempting me? Is it the security that comes with money? Is it kind of the status that comes with money? Is it just, what, what is it? What ways is money entangled in our hearts? But that's mostly another sermon. But what we see here is that under Barnabas's leadership, faith in Jesus broke the chains of greed. In this upwardly mobile, bustling city of commerce and industry and entrepreneurs and commerce. These new believers are free to love and serve others. They're a fruitful tree growing in a gutter. And into whose hand would you put all this collected cash? They give it to Barnabas. Back in chapter 4, when we first meet him, he used his wealth to serve the church. And now he's the kind of man that you could trust money with, to get that money where it needs to go. Oh, church, would that there were more Barnabases among us. Is there a job that needs to be done? Send a Barnabas. Are there a bunch of new Christians and their lives are crazy because they've been a Christian like five minutes? Send a Barnabas. He's going to encourage them. He's not going to ruin and squelch their face. He's going to, like, under his leadership, it'll grow. Do we need someone trustworthy with money? Send Barnabas. Luke wants us to love Barnabas and long to be like him. That's certainly one of Luke's points in this passage. But I actually think it's a sub point. I actually think it's a sub point. Here's the real question. Why does Luke want us to see that Barnabas is such a loving, sacrificial, wonderful Christian? Like, why? why? Why does that matter Why does Luke make such a big deal of him? Is it because Luke wants to see more Barnabases in their churches and in all churches? Yes, I'm sure that's true. But there's another reason. I want you to go back with me to the beginning of the passage. Luke 19, or excuse me, Acts 19, 11, 19, and 20 through 22. Look at these verses again. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word, and that's where I stopped last time I read it, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Stephen is executed. The Christians scatter, preaching about Jesus wherever they go. And yet, as some of them scatter, they preached only Jews. And when some of them scatter, they preach also to the Hellenists. Now, that's the word. Uh, it's come up a couple times when we've been preaching through the book of Acts. It just means, Greek spe- in this context, Greek-speaking non-Jewish people. Because it's contrasted with Jews. So there's like some who are preaching to the Jews, and there's some who are preaching to non-Jewish Greek-speaking people. Two groups. Some who preach selectively, and some who preach promiscuously. And Luke makes a big deal of Barnabas because he wants us to see that the blessings of God are upon the latter group, those who preach promiscuously. Look again at verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, the latter group. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The hand of the Lord is this Old Testament language for denoting the Lord's power and blessing, and the hand of the Lord's blessing was with them. Which them? The them who shared the gospel where it was hardest. The them who shared where natural affinity was the least. The them who trusted that the Lord wanted his blessings to flow far and wide, promiscuously to every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. What does this have to do with Barnabas? Look again at verse 22. 
The report of this, the Gentiles, the Hellenists, receiving the gospel, came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. The report of this, they say, the report of the Gentiles hearing and turning to the Lord. The established church doesn't know what to do with this report of Gentile conversions. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Which is it? So they send Barnabas to go inspect it. And Luke wants us to know it's a really good thing that they're hearing the word of the Lord. In fact, if you've been here for the last few weeks, you may be thinking, again? (laughs) This passage has the exact same theme as all of your other sermons in July. To that, I just say, yep, (laughs) apparently it does. Apparently, the need to love outsiders was difficult to get into the heads and hearts of the church. And apparently, it still is. I I don't want to give the exact specifics. But I'll tell you that in July, I found myself in a room full of people. Many people who were a lot like me, it seemed. And there were a few people who were not. And to be candid, what I at least perceive to be differences between us, a few group of people, annoyed me. Just, just, just to be candid. And I knew as an evangelical pastor, conservative guy, Bible preaching guy, I just assumed I was probably equally annoying to them. If I was right, it felt like a fa- safe assumption. And if anybody should be tired of these same sermon themes, I assume it'd be me, (laughs) right? I've either been up front or in the passage behind the scenes working with David and Ben as they've been preaching. If anybody should be tired of this, it should be us three. (laughs) And yet what I'll tell you is that listening to David preach last week and just thinking about these people, uh, thinking about the situation I had been in, the way I'd ignored them, I just felt this wave of conviction and shame. I I could have just said hello. Like, that's not hard in some ways. Could have walked over. I had an in. It would have been very easy to do so. Could have talked about how hot it was in Pennsylvania, right? (laughs) That's not hard. And I think even just that might have exploded stereotypes they had of pastors. More importantly, maybe misconceptions they have about Jesus. I don't know. Maybe we could have talked about even more. But I don't know how the conversation would have gone because I didn't even try. I just sat around talking to those who looked and believed a lot like me. Because it was easy. The truth that it's hard to love people different from us was difficult for the church in Jerusalem, and it still is for us. There are outward hindrances to the spread of the gospel, and there are internal hindrances. But that's why I believe Luke presents Barnabas the way he does. And not only Barnabas, the church in Antioch. This church in Antioch is, is, is an unlikely tree growing in a gutter. The established church wants to treat her growth with suspicion. They have to go inspect the tree. And then what happens? (laughs) Consider the beauty of the irony of God's grace. This tree grows so strong and becomes such a fruitful tree that the fruit from this tree feeds the church in Jerusalem when they have a famine. Not only should we share with outsiders because it's good and right and the thing that God wants to bless, but it's also true that those outsiders might be the very people who will bless on us one day in this strange and beautiful 
irony of the grace of God. I just consider on this point, if we had more time, if we were doing our 30, 40 minute sermons, I'd reflect for a while on the center of gravity shift from the west to the global south. What I mean by that is your run-of-the-mill Christian is not a white Christian in the West, but an African Christian or a Christian from Asia. The whole center of gravity is shifting, has shifted. And now the global South is sending missionaries to the West. But we don't have time for that, but I'll mention it. This passage here in Acts chapter 11, as we close, I'll say, is just one more reminder that the blessings of God flow even when life is hard. That the difficulty of life doesn't mean that the faucet of God's blessings are shut off. This passage is riddled with hindrances. Religious religious persecution created refugees. They had to flee their homes. And the internal struggle of loving people who don't look like us. Then comes a famine. And yet in the midst of this, God's church grows. It did then. I think by God's grace it still can. I think by God's grace it still is. I'll invite the worship team back up to lead us in a few songs as we close. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, if we were to circle up, just little groups of Christians here after church, or even those who aren't Christian, they're just just here and they're learning, they're listening, trying to figure out what it might mean to follow you and know you. And we were just to talk about hard things in our lives. We, We might be here a while. Maybe some of us should. And yet, Lord, I pray that you would just pour encouragement, a quickness back into our step, an excitement about the gospel, excitement about the church, an excitement about Jesus. For who he is and what he's doing. Lord, we have many things we could be discouraged about, but I just pray that you'd fill our hearts with joy as we gather, as we sing, as we study your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Let's stand together as we continue in worship. How great the chasm that lay between Desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to where my sin and bear my shame. The cross, the cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my
that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is the victory oh hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ So we're going to learn a new song this morning. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, it's called The Goodness of God. And so this is a wonderful song, um, just reminding ourselves of the ways that God has worked in our lives together. So um, we're going to sing the chorus, and then we'll get into the song. Um, but we're going to learn the chorus together first. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my life it's all my life you have been fire in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God all my life
Lord, you have been faithful. It's all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. You're dismissed. Have a great week.